strongyloidiasis is a disease that is caused by strongyloides stecoralis. And this is a very interesting uh, parasite because it has a very weird life cycle and how it causes the diseases and the diagnosis is also challenging. So I'd like to walk you through this um, uh, nematode. Its worldwide uh, prevalence is approximately 100 million, but it is uh, habiting in, in duodenum and duodenum in, as an adult form. It's unknown how long it can go on in, uh, in terms of a lifespan. And, and because of an ongoing auto-infection, which you're going to see um, in a moment. So let me start with this image here. So Strongyloides decoralis has um, a feature of existing as a free living and also parasitic. It's one of the very, very few um, parasites that, nematodes that have that feature of being both free living and also parasitic. And it has a different, it looks different when it is in free living and in, when it is in parasitic. Um, and this is an image of the free living strongyloides. So we see it's a, it's a very tiny one um, and it's in lava form. Uh, and then you could see this is an adult uh, form of the, of the uh, parasite. And then you could see this is a, also a parasitic version of the strongyloides decoralis. This is a female version of the um, strongyloides decoralis. And you will see here there are, um, it has some eggs that uh, strongyloides decoralis will be laying. So let's talk about the life cycle, which is very interesting for me. So <clears throat> this, this parasite, the reservoir hosts are primates and dogs. So they're usually in primates and, and dogs. And let's start from, let's say here, yeah, in the soil. So when the uh, the reservoir horse, whether a primate or a dog or someone lays eggs, uh, um, sorry, uh, defecates on the on the on the uh, soil, and in the soil the embryonated eggs. This is where the, uh, they mate, and then they release uh, the L larva forms. Now, what's interesting about this this parasite is that it has it, it, it's stuck between being both male and female. It's some form of a hermaphrodite, but not really a hermaphrodite. It is a serial hermaphroditic in terms of it is the one parasite can be an adult male, and then it deposits the sperms, produces sperms, and then they become ready, and then it disintegrates changes to become a female. And then the female version of it has the eggs. Then the sperm that were previously present in the male format, they get to be fertilized. Uh, and then, you know, they form larvae. So it's first stage larva, second stage larva, third stage larva, and then the fourth stage larva. And then again, just reach male, female, and all uh, the cycle continues. Now, when it is outside the human or in this free living, um, this this parasite continues in this cycle of it depends on on its feeding primarily feeding on on, on bacteria uh, and and other debris that is around the feet that uh, it comes out with. So when it comes out of the the reservoir host with the, with a piece of pieces, it's going to be eating and then uh, eats and then it molts and grows L one molts and grows L two L three L four and then again you know become male female same circle continues, but somehow. In between the cycle, when it reaches almost uh, finishing the food, uh, food that is reserved here, it's triggering the mechanisms, uh, food reservoir, food storage, it triggers it to become, uh, to get stuck in L3 and L3 stage. Now this is L3 stage is when up until it has been picked up uh, by, by human or any other horse. So let's say you come in and you step on these feces or you sit on them or somehow you get in contact with these feces that are, or the soil that had the feces uh, um, that had L3 version, this uh, L3 lava would penetrate the skin through uh, the hair follicles, even unbroken skin. It just goes through, it doesn't have to need a wound or anything. It gets in there. And once it gets in there, uh, it starts to, to change. 
um, it moves around, finds a way, just like how we see in, in the in the life cycles of uh, hookworms and then ascarids. It goes all the way to the liver, up to the sorry to the to the um, does the heart lung migration. This is the way the others will go to get into this to alveoli and then gets disseminated again to the bronchi and then you swallow it and then it goes the adult worms they'll be stuck in the in the small intestine. That is when these adult worms now parasitic versions they would go in the sequence of being you know male produce sperms um, and then deposit the sperms uh, and then they disintegrate became a female and then the moths again gives out the egg and then the larva get passed out into pieces. Now, a typical feature of this parasite, which is known as autoinfection, is, is when these larva now can, can develop in L3, or, and then they can enter the, the bloodstream. So as they enter the bloodstream, the cycle continues. Remember, the L3 goes back to infection, finds the way to the, the lungs, so it goes back all the way there, and then the cycle continues. The larva keeps continuing with its rotation. So it's sort of become free living inside uh, your your body, just like how it was happening outside. And then it, when it gets back to the to the intestine, it feeds on the bacteria, it, the cycle continues. Now, this is important also in terms of how the autoinfection can persist over years. And also it is important in terms of um, these, they can disseminate the bacteria on other places where, where it goes because it carries that bacteria and then goes away with them outside. So this is a very important life cycle. Uh, this parasite is free living and uh, parasitic and can also uh, continue with auto infection uh, within the body to cause um, continued illness. So <clears throat> clinical disease will be following an out for immunocompetent individuals. Big, big distinction here. For immunocompetent individual, the infection is usually very mild, right? So there's no prominent symptoms and, and sometimes you can have only watery diarrhea, also known as Cochin China diarrhea, because this, during the discovery of this uh, disease, uh, most of it was happening in China during the war season, I think like that. So if you're immunocompetent, uh, um, you would have only maybe one or two of these uh, um, parasites, and they would be mostly contained. The degree of which varies in intensity of infection. Approximately 25% of the symptomatic patients uh, they present with alternating diarrhea and constipation, abdominal discomfort, vomiting, epigastric pains that worsens after eating have been reported. Majority of the infected patients display no symptoms following infections. And this one can stay for a long time. So this is a chronic infection. Peripheral synophilia may be also uh, uh, or the only evidence of an acute infection. But generally, it's, it's, a, it's an, uh, a chronic infection, for, especially for immunocompetent people. <laughs> and some people can, can report uh, skin reactions, commonly called the groundage, due to penetration of where the, 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 the skin was infected by L3 lava. So this groundage is also a presentation um, of the people. So the rash around the skin is characteristic with the feet, but can be lo located anywhere that the lava penetrates, in the trunk or everywhere else. So the children with, with the strangulated stegoralis may develop a symptoms characteristic of anorexia, cachexia, chronic diarrhea, fat, and protein malabsorption, abdominal distension. These, these, these are also presenting because children sometimes might be immunocompromised. The immunity will not be as high. So they could present with much more um, uh, worse symptoms. So dissemination of this strangulodiasis can present with migration of the larva to the skin giving rise to the uh, serpiginous, uh, like the serpent-like lesions creeping into carrier eruptions. And also um, this condition is known as uh, cutaneous uh, lava currents. And then the lava may also be observed to migrate to the skin as fast as almost five to 15 centimeters per hour. That is how fast this thing is moving. And then you, you become pruritic and, and, and rushy places. So disseminated stronchilidiasis may also be present with petechio pruritic or uh, periumbilical um, parasitic thumbprint purpura, which is commonly present in, in the anterior abdomen on the lateral thigh. So you will see someone uh, because of the infection in the, in the, in the GI and then could, uh, it also affects the, the abdomen. So, but another uh, important factor that, uh, this is the periodic regions that you might be able to see uh, like um, lava currents. 
from strongyloides. So, in short, you would have a symptomatic synophilia, abdominal pains, dermatitis, especially lava kinds, pulmonary infiltrates with synophilia. We could have um, dissemination with dissemination with sepsis. This is dissemination with sepsis is when the parasite, uh, because it eats bacteria, it can go around and then spread them in your body. And it can also cause the diarrhea known as Cochin China, um, typical diarrhea. Now, I want to stress another thing here when it comes to comparing immunocompromised and immunocompetent people. For immunocompromised people, these are the ones who have HIV or even the ones who have received transplants of organs who received uh, long-term corticosteroid therapies. This, this becomes at risk of, uh, of developing uh, disseminated uh, strongyloidiasis. And there are cases where, uh, we can even look at PubMed, there are cases where uh, someone, because this is usually asymptomatic, so someone comes in with an infection um, to be to to and then has other complications, maybe needs kidney transplant or heart transplants, and they have undiagnosed strongyloidus infection that has been chronic over years um, in in their body. And once they start corticosteroid therapy, their body tends to allow uh, the, the 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 strongyloidus to now become disseminated. And this patient who's been receiving you know, a very expensive heart transplant or kidney transplant ends up dying uh, because of just not being able to diagnose strongyloidus before. So it's important to, to notice that for immunocompetent people, the infections might go undiagnosed. So in a clinical practice, it's important to be able to either screen for or treat um, uh, strongyloidus infection, especially for people come uh, in, in areas that it might be uh, endemic. So how do you diagnose this patient, right? So my, one is this microscopic identification of this uh, characteristic larvae in the pieces. And, and this is, we're used to knowing that you, you, you take the feces and you look for eggs, right? Or adult ones. This time when you look for eggs, you, you take the feces, you're not looking for eggs or adults, you're looking for larvae forms. And the unfortunate thing with this is because they don't release as many uh, larvae forms. They can release up to 50 larvae, L2 larvae released per day in adult uh, strongyloids compared to uh, to when we were looking at uh, ascarids, for example, who would get 200,000 eggs per day, you know, and, and this is a huge difference. So there is a very little amount of larvae that you'd have as two. And, and as, as, you could, as much as 50 to 70% of the cases can be missed when you do microscopic assessment of the of the stools uh, uh, to be able to want to diagnose this, and if you want, if you're able to see them, you could look at them. This is how they look. Uh, the, this is a normal hookworm, but then the strongyloides larvae have a typical fork-like um, forked end in the larva form. So this is how you'll be able to distinguish uh, between the the hookworm larvae and and uh, and these uh, strongyloids. Another thing you could do is fecal culture. Now, fecal culture, as if you remember when I told you before, you put uh, this larva eats eat bacteria in the feces. So when you, in other labs, that would take out the, 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 uh, the fecal material and then put the, the uh, sample there and then they would culture. And then this one, they would try to see how long it would take um, until the, 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 larvae start to migrate and then show the lines that are dragging around to move uh, during the culture. And other people, there, this is known as corporal culture, uh, co culturing using feces. Alternatively, some labs can use um, also, you mix stool with bone charcoal, also known as charcoal culture, uh, to, die, to be able to culture this and be able to, to identify these organisms. But then uh, this, this organism is very fastidious and it can move around, it's very unsafe too work around with unless you're really qualified. So this leaves us with serological testing. So there are several, you know, serological testing, including ELISA for, to check for um, IgG uh, responses. Some sensitivities might vary, but there are now tests that can uh, have sensitivity up to 85% or more uh, to be able to, to, to identify these parasites. But then there's unfortunate part, there is a, a cross-reactivity um, with, with other helmets when it comes to the immune response because serological testing check for your immune response. 
Um, there's also nucleic acid amplification tests. These are like PCRs, which are under development. But you know what? What would be the problem with PCR is you do PCR analysis or polymerase chain reaction analysis in a stool sample. The stool sample has very small amount of uh, of the lava, so it's very difficult to be able to do that. So sometimes you could use multiplex uh, quantitative PCR, which would have a better a better uh, chance at detecting this. In the multiplex uh, quantitative PCR, this is where you you uh, you do multiple iterations uh, for the PCR, and they will help you, especially when you have samples that have very very low amount of. Uh, um, uh, of, of DNA for you to to um, to uh, diagnose. Again, so this the, the this parasite have this uh, uh, tendency to cause hyper infection because of the repeated infection, especially for people who have uh, immunocompromise, and they can lead to intestinal perforations. They can lead to hemorrhagic pneumonias. Uh, they can lead to shock, uh, hepcepsis, uh, and and even the gram negative. Uh, meningitis can also happen in the case of strongolidiasis. Um, treatment for uncomplicated infection, which is not not hyper infections, not anything. You could just give ivermectin 200 micrograms per day per kilogram, and you could repeat two weeks later, uh, and then it would it would work. Ivermectin is a drug of choice for for uh, strongolidiasis. Albendazole is a, an inferior choice. But you could use it, but you know, tendency to recur is also high. So you could keep shedding. Ivermectin is a drug of choice. For disseminated disease, again, ivermectin um, uh, you could be used depending on how long it takes you for you to respond. And then uh, you could add per oral if working with response up until you're completely labeled. Some of the people have been treated with uh, subcutaneous dosing of, of ivermectin that are. Uh, is based on on veterinarian uh, drugs, which is not really um, FDA approved, but this is something that they use. So that is that is all uh, with regards to strong diagnosis, and this is a publication I would like you to go and read. Um, it's very interesting, and this parasite is a very interesting parasite. That I think um, there are several publications, and there's another one that is related to diagnosis. I'll also share with you to um, to read. Thank you.